Welcome to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Virtual CF Education Day, Infection Control and Germs. I'm Leslie Hazel, Director of Patient Resources at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. To hear an update related to healthcare coverage, CF clinical research, CF lung health and disease, nutrition, fertility, quality improvement in CF care, building life skills to manage CF, and answers to issues related to employment and schools, please watch an archived webcast on the CF Foundation website. All of these webcasts were supported through an unrestricted educational grant by Genentech. This presentation will focus on infection control and some of the different germs found in the lungs of people with cystic fibrosis. You will be hearing from leading experts in CF germs and how they spread. Dr. John LaPuma is a professor of pediatric infectious diseases and epidemiology at the University of Michigan. And Dr. Lisa Seyman is a professor of clinical pediatrics at Columbia University and New York Presbyterian Hospital. They will take an in-depth look at these topics and answer questions from the CF community. John is also the director of the CF Foundation Burkholderia Cepatia Research Laboratory and Repository at the University of Michigan. Lisa, in addition to being a leading researcher in CF germs and how they spread, is the lead author of the infection control recommendations for patients with cystic fibrosis. If you have additional questions about infection control and germs, please partner with your CF care center to get your questions answered and to help educate others about the importance of infection control and their role in helping to prevent the spread. This presentation, we will talk about the principles of infection control, how germs are spread, and describe different infection control practices for different settings like clinic, the hospital, or non-healthcare settings like the home. So welcome, Lisa and John. Hi, and of course, my first question is, what is infection control? Well, I think most simply, infection control is studying where germs come from and how they are spread. It's developing ways to prevent the spread of germs and it's teaching how to avoid uh, becoming infected. One of the things that we want to emphasize is that infection control is only one part of CF care, but nutrition, airway clearance, and taking the important medications for CF people also help to preserve lung health. So how can a person, how does infection control help people with cystic fibrosis? Infection control is intended to help keep you healthy it tries to prevent lung infections, which can infect lung health, treatments that you require, and even affect lung transplantation. And as John mentioned, helps you to learn ways to avoid germs. So Lisa, I introduced you as the lead author on the infection control recommendations. Um, what are they and how are they developed? Well, I'm glad you asked that <laughs> question, Leslie. <laughs> what we did was we assembled an expert committee consisting of doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and people with CF, and we reviewed the published research, and then we developed evidence-based guidelines for the hospital, for the clinic setting, and for non-healthcare settings, particularly the home. It's important to emphasize that these guidelines will be revised as new knowledge is gained from ongoing research. Speaking of ongoing research, ongoing research enables us to um, make changes in infection control. There have been a number of changes in CF uh, that have also caused us to change uh, the way we do infection control. For example, people with CF are uh, living longer. The uh, age expectancy is now over 37 years. Almost half of people with CF are adults. And as people with CF live longer, they may uh, be at risk for new germs. Also, the way we uh, manage uh, you know, cystic fibrosis patients, delivery of care is different. It's now shifted mainly from hospital to outpatient. There are separate clinics for children and adults. And we use a lot more antibiotics now uh, by mouth, inhaled, and IV. And germs uh, become resistant uh, or more difficult to kill uh, to these antibiotics. So then how are germs spread in CF? And um, how do people with CF get these germs? Where do they come from? So Leslie, there are three major ways that germs are spread. One is by direct contact um, with infected respiratory tract secretions from another person, such as could occur with kissing. Another way that germs may be spread are by indirect contact. 
So, but I want to go back for a minute. You said kissing. We had a question from a grandmother who wanted to know, is it okay for her three-year-old grandchild with CF to kiss her on the mouth, or should she really work to have the child kiss her on the cheek, or for her to kiss her child on the cheek? Well, what we'll be emphasizing throughout the webcast is that even people without CF may transmit certain germs to people with CF when they're sick. So we would tell that grandmother certainly not to be around that child while she had a cold, for example. Ah, so now back to your indirect contact. I'm sorry I interrupted no, you. No, no problem, Leslie. So the second way that germs may be spread um, for, to people with CF is through indirect contact with an object or a person who has infected respiratory tract secretions that may contaminate, for example, the hands, a drinking glass, or even the clothing of the staff members taking care of someone with CF. And germs may live for hours, particularly when moist, on surfaces. So how do these germs, our moisture perspective? Um, well, I'll talk a little bit about droplets, which okay. is the third way that germs may be spread, and that will help answer that question. So respiratory droplets that may contain germs are spread by coughing, sneezing, and even singing. These infected droplets can travel very short distances, about three to six feet, before they settle down on a nearby surface. But again, germs may live in those droplets for hours. So we've had many questions regarding, regarding what are the important germs in CF. And so um, can you kind of go over some of the important germs in cystic fibrosis that people need to be aware of? Sure, let's spend a few minutes talking about some of the more common uh, germs. And these are mainly bacteria and also viruses. Among the bacteria that are most uh, common in CF, certainly Pseudomonas aeruginosa, sometimes abbreviated PA, is the most common and most problematic uh, bacteria that we see in CF. Burkholderia cepacea complex, sometimes just referred to as B. cepacea, is uh, also of great concern. Staphylococcus aureus, or staph, is another bacteria that we see very commonly in CF. And more recently, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, MRSA has become quite a concern. And then there are a number of respiratory viruses that we'll talk about uh, through the course of the conversation. So are we going to be able to talk about swine flu in that respiratory virus section? We certainly will talk oh, about good, swine Oh good, because we got a lot of questions. We promise. Okay. <laughs> this is a slide, Leslie, that shows the uh, frequency of certain bacteria in cystic fibrosis. And so you can see along the left-hand side of this chart uh, the percent of people with CF who are infected with different bacteria. And then along the bottom, we see different age ranges. So you can see, for example, looking at this, uh, if you look at the red line, which is mm -hmm. P. aeruginosa, uh, early on, 25% or so of people are infected. That rises pretty steeply then uh, as people uh, get into their teens and young adulthood. So by the time people are 25 years of age, about 80% are infected. So you can see the relative uh, proportions of these different bacteria in CF here. And just for clarification, the P. aeruginosa is the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, or PA, you talked about earlier. Correct. Okay, so we excellent. refer to that P. aeruginosa, or Pseudomonas aeruginosa, or PA. Okay. Now, how do we find germs in people with CF? Mm -hmm. Well, we really need specialized laboratories to do this, and they use specialized processing for processing uh, uh, culturing uh, respiratory secretions. We recommend that cultures are obtained about every three months. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also very important for people with CF to know their culture results. So, so why, what do they do with their culture results information? Well, Leslie, you know, as we'll be talking about, different germs um, require different practices, for example, in the hospital setting, and it will help people understand a lot more why they are having some of those practices mm -hmm. performed and why they might be not able to do certain things in the hospital setting or, you know, in, a, in any other kind of setting. That's right. So, okay, that, well, that's good to know. Now, it's important to emphasize that we still don't always know how people with CF become infected, but there is very strong evidence that people with CF can get germs from each other. Mm -hmm. And infection control that we'll be talking about now can really reduce the risk of that occurring. Well, that's good to know. So how do you know that the germs get transmitted between people with CF? Well, we have ways in the laboratory to fingerprint mm -hmm. uh, certain bacteria. And here's an example on this slide. What we can see here is that each row or each lane in this gel mm -hmm. is a bacteria that came from a different person with CF. And what we do when we fingerprint is we match up these patterns. 
And you can see where there are two patterns that match up. Um, this really indicates that those are the same bacteria from two different people. Mm -hmm. Situations where the uh, pattern is different indicates that it's a different uh, bacteria. So by using these sorts of uh, methods, we can follow the spread of bacteria from one person to another. And, and following that spread is sometimes called following the strain of bacteria between the same person. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about Pseudomonas. Well, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, as I said earlier, is the most common cause of infection in CF. It usually causes a chronic infection. It's found in hospitals and clinics in the natural environment. It can live for a long time on surfaces. In the healthcare setting, we know that people with CF, uh, CF staff, uh, and even in the air uh, are places where we can find Pseudomonas. And based on those methods that I just showed in the previous slide, we know that those can be the same strains that are found in people with CF. Mm. In other healthcare settings, such as the dentist's office, we know that dental equipment can become contaminated, but it's easy to sterilize. Oh, well, that's good to know. It's easy to sterilize. We also know that Pseudomonas aeruginosa can spread between people with CF. This has been very well documented and shown in CF clinics in Europe and Australia, not so much in the U.S., however. Okay, I gotta ask, why don't we know that in the United States? I think the simple answer, uh, Leslie, is that we just haven't looked hard enough, and we really need to do more research in that area to see if that is occurring in the okay. U.S. So we could find it out with a focus on research within that area. I think with more research and more of the types of studies using those methods that I just showed, I think we could uh, go a long way in determining if that's happening. Okay, so we've talked about healthcare settings. What about non-healthcare settings? Where would Pseudomonas might be? Well, again, Pseudomonas can be in the environment. We also know that it likes moist places, so that means it can be found in swimming pools and in hot tubs. Swimming pools can be adequately chlorinated and can be quite safe. Mm -hmm. Hot tubs, however, are very difficult to chlorinate, and uh, we would recommend avoiding hot tubs. Why are they so hard to chlorinate? Well, the temperature gets so hot that you can't keep an adequate concentration of chlorine. Ah, very good to know. So what about uh, B. cepatia or Burkholderia cepatia? Well, B. cepatia is actually not just one species of bacteria. We found out some years ago that it is a number of species. And many of these species within this complex can quickly lower lung mm -hmm. function, uh, can cause chronic infection as well. Uh, again, a number of different species, they occur in different um, rates in CF. Uh, the most common are B. cenocepatia and B. multivorans. Mm. You may also hear the, the names B. vietnamiensis, B. delosa, and B. cepatia. These are also part of that B. cepatia complex, but they are species that occur less frequently. B. gladioli is another name that you may have heard. This is not part of the B. cepatia complex, but it is a related bacteria. It's also a Burkholderia, and it's becoming more common in CF. So I, uh, I know there's a lot of concern about B. cepatia complex and, and particular species. What is there a particular species that affects the health of people with CF more than others? Well, we have some evidence that there are differences between these species. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to them occurring in different frequencies, some are more common than others, we think that B. cenocepatia uh, may be a little more dangerous to people with CF than some of the other species. So it can worsen their lung disease much more quickly and more dramatically than maybe some of the other species. Correct. Okay, so where do they find B. cepatia? Well, B. cepatia is an inhabitant in the natural environment in soil and particularly around the roots of plants. Now, how much uh, B. cepatia comes from those sources that infects people with CF is not entirely clear. We also know that it can spread mm -hmm. uh, in the ways that Lisa described earlier, direct, indirect contact and in, uh, droplets. Certainly people sharing hospital rooms or around contaminated respiratory uh, equipment, contaminated sinks, showers, handshaking, um, poor hand washing, these are all ways that B. cepatia can spread. Mm -hmm. B. cepatia can also spread between siblings. We've known this for quite some time. Among non-healthcare uh, uh, individuals, people outside of hospitals and clinics, uh, a number of ways that Lisa talked about as well, kissing, sharing a toothbrush, etc. And there's also spread um, among people with CF who socialize together, that is to say spend significant amounts of time in fairly small spaces. So let's uh, move on. What about uh, MRSA or methicillin resistant Staph aureus? First, I'm going to say a word about regular Staph aureus, okay. which has been known to be quite common in people with CF, as John showed you on that slide earlier. Um, and methicillin resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA, has been described since the 1970s. And initially, 
was responsible for infections in people without CF who had risk factors like recent hospitalization or surgery. Then in the 1990s, we started seeing MRSA more and more in people with CF. And then MRSA continued to change until the late 90s when we started to see community-acquired MRSA causing infections in people without CF who didn't have any of those risk factors. And then in the, in the 2000s, more and more of those community-acquired strains. So today, MRSA is increasingly common. It um, infects about 17% of all people with CF and is most common in people who are between 11 and 17 years old. We are now finding through some new research that those community acquired strains have been infecting people with MRSA and additional research showing that MRSA in general can cause worse lung function in people with CF. So then how does MRSA spread and can it move from uh, one part of the body to another? Mm. It's a very good question, and I'm not sure that we have all the answers to that question. We know that MRSA can spread, these are those community-acquired strains, primarily between people without CF, usually through skin-to-skin -skin contact. MRSA can spread between people with CF, as we previously described, mm -hmm. through contact with infected secretions. And now, again, with new research just recently um, published, MRSA can spread between people without CF and with CF. And that is really different than what John was talking about before with Pseudomonas and Burkholderia, where those germs do not spread between people with CF and people without CF. So could someone without CF who has MRSA get together with somebody who has CF um, I mean, should they get together or should they stay away from each other? Well, if somebody has an MRSA infection, mm -hmm. they should definitely not come near a person with cystic fibrosis. Oh, that's good to know. So now let's go to respiratory viruses. Okay, we're getting closer to swine flu. Oh, yes. <laughs> so um, respiratory viruses share something in common with MRSA in that respiratory viruses can spread between people without CF and people with CF. And we'll talk more about that during the webcast. So viruses are also known to cause pulmonary exacerbations in people with CF. And a couple of common viruses that we'll mention are influenza or the flu, which occurs every year uh, as seasonal flu. Um, the rhinovirus, otherwise known as the common cold, and then a virus called respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, which can cause bronchiolitis or wheezing in infants and young children with and without CF. Viruses spread very easily between people. Everybody, um, I'm sure, has found one member of their family having a cold, and suddenly it spreads through everybody. And again, it spreads through indirect contact, touching an object with the flu virus, like a glass, and then touching the mouth and the nose or the eyes, or droplets. For example, when a person with the flu were to cough or sneeze near another susceptible person. So are there any specific precautions um, to help prevent the spread of viruses that uh, related to H1N1 or swine flu that we want to touch on now or do you want to wait later? I think that we'll go ahead and touch on those later because they'll be very common themes. But I do get the opportunity here to talk about vaccinations. Um, so we're going to emphasize that not only should people with CF get all of the routine vaccinations that are listed on that slide, but in efforts not only to keep themselves healthy, but to keep people with CF around them healthy, friends and family members of people with CF should get vaccinated, and that would include the flu, the influenza virus uh, so, vaccine as well. So the seasonal flu virus, so every fall, as well as the s vaccination for swine flu, assuming it comes out according to the government's information that we have. Is that correct? That is correct. correct. Oh, excellent. So how do you prevent the spread of germs in general? What do you do? Well, there are some basic principles for successful infection control uh, in CF. First, we have to understand that everyone with CF may have germs in their lungs and could spread those germs to others. Uh, staff, and that includes people in clinic and hospital, people with CF, their family, their friends, really have to be kept educated about infection mm -hmm. control. And as you said early on, new research could lead to new um, information that could allow us to change the guidelines to improve them.
Well, that's good to know. What about hand hygiene? Oh, I'm so glad you asked about <laughs> hand hygiene. You prepped me I well. I prepped you well. So hand hygiene is the most important part of infection control that we can do, and it must be done by everyone. Staff, people with CF, family members and friends. And we know in many, many settings that hand hygiene will reduce infections. You can do it with alcohol-based hand gels. You can do it with plain old soap and water. And what I really want to emphasize is that you need to make hand hygiene routine, carry the Purell with you, teach very young people with CF how to do hand hygiene, and educate others, friends and families, to perform hand hygiene. So when should hand hygiene be done? Well, imagine now that you've coughed on your hands, mm. um, covered your nose while you've sneezed, perform hand hygiene. After you've touched a public item like an ATM machine, um, gone to a play area or a gym, before and after respiratory therapy equipment, before and after leaving the clinic, and before and after pulmonary function testing, for example. Healthcare providers also need to perform oh. hand hygiene. This is critically important. We don't want to be responsible for spreading germs between people. After touching patients, before touching patients, before and after touching surfaces in their rooms. And again, don't be afraid to ask your care providers to clean their hands because sometimes they do forget and you need to feel comfortable asking them to do that. Another critically important part of infection control is respiratory hygiene. Respiratory hygiene is what you do to contain respiratory secretions. And these two practices, hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene, were very, very important in our hospital during the swine flu outbreak. So respiratory hygiene means coughing or sneezing those respiratory tract secretions into a tissue and throwing that tissue away. Respiratory hygiene should be done by everyone. And I'll say, for example, in my children's school, the kids were taught how to sneeze and cough into the crook of their arm in order to contain the secretions. And again, another prime example where everyone around you should be educated about respiratory hygiene. Yes, I know. I have a 12-year-old, a and I keep reminding him to cover his mouth, do hand hygiene, all those good things to help contain germs. So I would assume that respiratory hygiene and hand hygiene are the number one and two way to prevent the spread of swine flu between people in general. And making sure that mm -hmm. people who are sick stay home. Ah, right. that's, it. that's another good point. <laughs> we'll talk more about that. So we've limited um, germs from spreading. What about specific situations? What are good infection control practices say in clinic? So again, this was covered in the document that you mentioned earlier, the guidelines for infection control in CF. And some of the practices that we recommended were actually having very limited time in the waiting areas. So people with CF would not have an opportunity to be too close together asking families to bring in their own toys and books and magazines, not using the common items in the waiting areas, and then again, hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, and no handshaking. Also, not to socialize. Um, one of the wonderful expressions that several clinics I know use is a wink and a nod will do, meaning an acknowledgement that you know that someone that you know is nearby, but not having any close contact, not having a handshake. And it's important also to practice these um, different things, not only in the waiting area, but in other healthcare areas as well. For example, in the pulmonary function test laboratory. Yeah, good example. So I get a number of these questions. Should people with CF wear masks at CF clinic? <laughs> a great question mm -hmm. for which we currently don't have scientific evidence that masks prevent the spread of germs between people with CF. John and I have actually talked a lot about this together. But I do go around the United States a lot um, for CF education days and have seen that a lot of clinics do ask everyone to wear masks. And it is true that masks can stop the spread of germs if they're worn properly. But I need to emphasize that I've seen little children wear them as necklaces and earrings and hats. So it can be difficult for young mm -hmm. children to wear a mask. But another thing that I think is important is that it can let people with CF know who else in the waiting area may have CF. But we need to always remember that even if you're wearing a mask, you still need to do hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene as well. So what about in a hospital setting? What about germ containment there? Yeah. So in hospitals, we actually do a little bit more, and that is something called isolation precautions. So if a person 
is infected with particular germs, and this is not only for CF people, this is for people without CF mm -hmm. who are hospitalized as well. For example, the germs that we talked about earlier, MRSA, the Burkholderia, or flu, those people are placed on isolation precautions, meaning a single room. We ask the staff and the visitors to wear a gown and gloves to prevent those germs from leaving the room mm -hmm. with them, and um, that the patients should only leave the room for medically necessary procedures. So a question that came in is, if a child with CF is hospitalized, should they go or can they go to the general playroom? Mm, good yeah. question. Yeah, really good question. <laughs> and um, what I'll say is that every hospital has a, an infection control department. And rules and regulations for the playrooms are actually written down and worked out. Um, m what I can tell you in our hospital that we do, if a child is on precautions for a specific germ, they are not permitted to, to use the playroom. But if they're not, if they're hospitalized without one of those germs, they can go to the playroom. But we do not allow two children with CF to be in the playroom at the same time because we're worried that we would have difficulty maintaining that three-foot rule. Mm -hmm. So how does someone deal with being isolated or on these isolation precautions when they're in the hospital? Yeah, so an important point. We, we recognize that these isolation precautions have a psychosocial impact. And um, people on those precautions do feel separated from their friends. So we're saying, please, please have lots of visitors, non-CF visitors, of course, and have entertainment in the room, a phone, a computer. We know that people in isolation do feel bored and lonely and sometimes even depressed, frankly. So bring in activities, partner with the child life group to allow that person to have things come into them and even up to and including like an exercise bicycle so that activities can be ongoing. So what about infection control in non-healthcare settings like the home? Yeah, so there we go again, Leslie. <laughs> Doing frequent hand hygiene. So we sort of talked about that before, I'm carrying the Purell, theme. right, right. And the respiratory hygiene and not socializing with others. But this, this point of educating family and friends. And what I want to emphasize is don't assume just because you told people once that they got it. It may take multiple examples and multiple reminders in order to feel that you fully educated your family and friends about these principles. And again, please ask those family and friends to stay away from your loved ones with CF if they're sick. So what about taking care of nebulizer equipment? Cleaning, disinfecting, what's recommended? Well, it's very important to keep your nebulizer equipment clean. Uh, main thing is cleaning it properly and uh, there are instructions, directions that come uh, with this equipment to tell people exactly how to do that. Nebulizers can be disinfected in a number of ways, boiling, using microwave, dishwasher, a number of disinfectants are also very effective. It's very, very important to air dry nebulizers. Most of the bacteria and the germs we talked about don't like to be dried. They don't live very well once they are dried. So that's probably the most important element. I think it's also important when you're talking about caring uh, for nebulizer equipment to have a routine, to have a schedule you, that you can, that becomes more or less automatic, that you just do all the time. It's important to maybe have two sets of nebulizer equipment. Replace the ne nebulizer regularly, replace it if it's cracked or otherwise uh, worn out. Uh, those are all very common sense type of steps. So what suggestions do you have about, so people can cope with infection control guidelines and practices? So we've um, mentioned how important it is to educate others and that also includes teachers and classmates and friends and family members as we said. One example that I heard that I loved was um, that a mom every time her child was coming into a new school met with that child's teacher before the school year and then organized a Purell and tissue drive uh -huh. among the other classmates so there was always an adequate supply mm -hmm. of those things and that would be a benefit to all the children in the classroom particularly during for example you know the cold season. Um, similarly education about hand hygiene and then encouraging lots and lots of friends and um, making sure that those friends actually understand the importance of infection control and CF. Um, now, I admit I am a healthcare provider and I know not everybody does infection control practices all the time. Why not? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is an unfortunate truth and um, it is another example of something that the CF Foundation funded some research in, Leslie, 
And um, we have conducted um, surveys among various um, health care providers as well as people with CF and their family members. And what we've learned is that sometimes people have not been educated or maybe they were educated and they forgot those basic principles. Sometimes, unfortunately, they disagree with the recommendations, haven't felt like the evidence supports the recommendations, and we need to continually educate or, as we've been saying, generate additional research to convince people. Um, another theme that I've heard um, over and over again that is difficult to deal with is that sometimes the desire to socialize with others with CF for the obvious reasons of the psychosocial support that that implies outweighs the perceived health mm -hmm. risk and we need to really work hard on that. And then finally on the healthcare worker side, sad but true, it can be perceived as inconvenient and time consuming to do some of these sound principles like hand hygiene and using gowns and gloves. So this is one of those examples that we have to keep working at it. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, John, for a very informative discussion um, related to infection control. And just to summarize, it's important to do frequent hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, not to socialize with others with cystic fibrosis, help to educate friends and families about infection control, and if they are ill, ask them to stay away to help prevent infections. We recognize that it is very hard to lead an active life and avoid germs. That's why it's very important for you to be proactive, to talk with your CF healthcare team, know what your respiratory cultures are, do respiratory and hand hygiene, and partner with your CF care center to educate and help prevent the spread of germs. To learn about germs in CF, what you should know, how to avoid the spread, and information about the flu, go to the CF Foundation's website under Living with Cystic Fibrosis, Staying Healthy section. This is also where there will be information about the H1N1 or swine flu and cystic fibrosis. You can learn more about swine flu on the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's website at www.cdc.gov forward slash H1N1 flu. They will have additional general information for the public related to vaccinations, traveling information, and more. Their website also has general information about infection control and guidelines. On their home page, in the A to Z index at the top of the page, you can click the letter I and then scroll down to infection control to be able to learn more. The United States National Library of Medicine at the National Institute of Health on their website has a searchable database of all medical journals that have been published and their articles. This includes the infection control recommendations for patients with cystic fibrosis. You can search by infection control recommendations and cystic fibrosis or the first author's name, in this case, Lisa Saiman, so it's S-A-I-M-A-N and the letter L. These recommendations were published in May of 2003 in the Journal of Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology. As we said, the science related to infection control is growing and an air, it is an area of research the CF Foundation supports. So we're working to answer these questions. And remember, the practices of infection control will be refined and updated as we learn more. The Foundation also includes, uh, also supports research related to drugs that will help to treat these infections. These are in the anti-infective group section of the Foundation's Therapeutic Drug Development Pipeline, and you can see what's currently in clinical trials and what has been approved by the FDA. You can learn more about clinical trials related to antibiotics by clicking on Find a Clinical Trial in the Quick Links section of the Foundation's website. To narrow your search, click on Limit by Type of Therapy and then click on Anti-Infection Therapies. When you do the search, the results will be clinical trials currently in process related to antibiotics to help fight lung infections in people with cystic fibrosis. In conclusion, I encourage you to please complete the evaluation for this program on the website. 